right, God bless everybody. Welcome to Monday night Digging Deeper Bible Study. Um, I got a slide up here, the American flag laying on the Bible. Um, sometimes we we tend to uh, drape the cross with an American flag, and we kind of we we look at the Bible from the aspect that you know God's speaking directly to us. And I know that we, as the church, are a part of God's plan, and I believe the United States fits in there somewhere. I mean, you know, it's a nation, and it was established upon Christian principles. Uh, we, we shouldn't always try to interpret God's word from an, an American or you know an, an American or USA perspective. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer right quick. Uh, just um, pray for our nation. Let's pray for one another. We have several people that are that are sick, and uh, we're going to lift them up. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this Monday evening, Father. We we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Father, for your presence that we feel. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son, Lord God, Father. We we lift up our nation. We lift up this church and the, the leadership and pastor, Lord, and his family and those that are sick, Lord, um, Melissa and her family, Lord. We lift up Cindy, Father, and, and just numbers of others, Lord, and I, I can't name them all right now, but we lift them up. Father, anoint our eyes to see and our ears to hear, Lord, and, and gracious with your presence, Father, and your wisdom. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. So I'm going to start with Hebrews 10, 30, 31, but this is just giving you a little bit of background. Pastor, can you have him turn that down a little bit? I hear myself too much or something. But all right, Hebrews 10, 30, and 31, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And here, we, this is a passage that's very familiar. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we know also that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Second Peter, and I, all I'm doing is giving you some background about where we're going. Chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. For if, listen to this, this is for... For anybody that thinks that you can't fall away, we, or if you want to call it backslide or whatever. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, to me that qualifies them as a saved person. Okay, If they've accepted and escaped the pollutions of the world through coming to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right? Now, if after they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. See, this proverb is going to prove what I just showed you in verse 20. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow... The King James says that was washed. This is the new King James. A sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. She was clean and she was out of the mud. Now she's gone back to the mud. And as a re dog returns to his own vomit. So is someone that had a knowledge. Now I'm going to inject because the, the, the context of that. I say it's a saving knowledge. If they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, they've been saved, okay? And then they become, they, they turn away, they, they go back. They are again entangled in them. Now, in Proverbs says, it says, a righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up again. I'm not talking about falling down, but I'm, you know, if you, if you fall down and you stay down and you don't, you don't come back to the Lord, you know. This is Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? The, this one who is glorious in his apparel, 
traveling in the greatness of his strength, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Now, who in the whole universe, according to the Bible and for us as Christians, there's only one that's mighty to save, right? And that's Jesus. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, in my anger, and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and have stained all my robes. Listen to this. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. Now that's a little, that's a little hint as verse 4 right there. The year of my redeemed is, is, is set apart right there. And the day of vengeance is in his heart. Oh. Like I said earlier, many times we over here in the United States tend to drape the cross... And, and I had God's word covered with an American flag. And we try hard as we can to frame the, the, uh, the context and the history of the Bible from an American perspective. That is about an impossible task. And many times it puts a burden upon the scriptures because you're trying to inject something from a total you know, different time period. And we're, we're not the Jews. We're not... Israel. We're not, you know, um, and, and we're the Gentiles. Now, Daniel talks about these kingdoms and, you know, and, and the, the rise and fall, and, and we're in there somewhere. I believe we, we were at one time a Christian nation, but I feel like we mirror Israel in a very similar path that they took in the fact that they turned away from God. And they turned their back on God. So we're going, I've got some Bible for you tonight. And one of the best ways, you know, we, we love studying God's word and this is what we're here for. But you got to put it in context. And so we're going to make some connections. So the title of this teaching tonight that I give this is, When What Jesus Doesn't Say Is As Important as what he does say. And so with that, let me show you this right here. We're going, we're starting real. All of that was for foundation. Right here in Luke 4, 14 through 17. Now, Jesus is in, in Luke 3, he's come. John the Baptist was baptizing at Jordan. Jesus went out, you know, he received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He come up out of the water after John baptized him. You know, the Holy Spirit descends upon as a dove. His Father, God the Father, speaks from heaven. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit drives him into the wilderness short time after, according to the Bible. And he, you know, well, he fasts for 40 days, and the devil comes to tempt him. All right? Well, he's, he comes back, and he repels the devil, saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. So this sets the, the scene for verse 14, after what just happened. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Now, the, the tradition was if, if you come to town, if you were a stranger and Jesus had been gone for a while, and he came back and uh, with, with the Torah, there's, there's a schedule. So, and, and they stick to that schedule. They, they would read a book out of the, you know, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, and then they will read something from the law and the prophets, okay? So there was already, because of that schedule, there was certain scrolls laid out. Now, these translations are going to say a book. It's not a book. It was a scroll, 
but it was a scroll. They got a scroll for, you know, it's going to tell us right here, Isaiah, right? And so they got a scroll for all these books, and they, they got cabinets they store them in. So that, you know, here Jesus comes in, and as what is normal for anybody that came to town, if, you know, they wanted to hear something new, and you could give some commentary, so, or, or read the word, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he read this in Hebrew, okay? <laughs> but um, it, we, we got Aramaic floating around, we got common Greek floating around, you know, but it, 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 you know, they were, they were Hebrews, and, and then maybe, it don't, it don't matter anyway. Look at verse 17. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. See, that was on the schedule to read. You, you get that? They're just te- uh, taken, but Jesus entered the synagogue at the, exa- at, at the precise time when that was on the schedule, and it was, you know, here, this is the scroll, And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable, some translations say acceptable, year of the Lord and he closed the book gave it back to the attendant because see there's a special guy his job was to get the the scrolls the books out of the cabinet and take them to the people and you know lay them out okay this is today's scroll that's that attendant guy right there and he closed the book gave it to the attendant and sat down this is huge right here and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. All right? And I'm going to show you here in a moment. And he began to say to them, Today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's, I can't say enough to the stage that was set. And him coming in to Nazareth where, you know, where he was raised right here. And he, he reads this this passage of, of, of the Old Testament, and he, you know, and says, today, this has come to pass right here. Wow, wow. That's, that's amazing. And especially, so we, we got to do a little, little digging on this. So we know it was a scroll, it was Isaiah. Not everybody knows it, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord... God is upon me. Now, I'm going to show you something right here. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Notice what is missing at the end of Lord. Now, in the original Hebrew, there was not any punctuation marks. But uh, for us in the English, for us in the, 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 the Greek, you know, there are. So Jesus stopped in the middle of a sentence. Notice, no, and so verse, he, he reads Isaiah 61, verse 1, verse the first part, A, of verse 2. I've showed you this before, but it's been a couple years back. And so what's in yellow, he, he reads, but he does not read this other part. But I'm going to read it for you now. And the day, see, and, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So let's, we're going to look at this for a moment. Hmm. You know, it's, it, it, it makes me want to, oh, well, oh, there's got to be something going on here, right? 
You know, I, I, I get excited when, when the Lord and, and Jesus shows something to us right in front of our face and people go their whole lives and they, they, they don't uncover a nugget. Uh, and it's my job to, to, to dig some nuggets out, but it's, it's your job also. And let's look at it in some other translations. This is in other translations. This is the New King James. This is the NIV the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, and the KJV. So let's, we're looking for these punctuation to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God, semicolon, to comfort all who mourn, comma. See, this sentence is in, in several verses long. All right? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, no comma, and the day of vengeance of our God, all right? So, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a comma and the day of vengeance of our God. But with that comma, whoever, Isaiah, when he initially wrote this down, that thought with that comma had to be included in that sentence because it was connected. Do y'all see that? This is astounding that Jesus would stop in the middle of a sentence and say, today this is fulfilled. You hear this listening to me. This is when it's fulfilled. So, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. So I, wish, I wanted to show you this because this is not just the King James Version or I'm showing you in the, out of the NASB, but this is a lot of translations. Let's, let's even look at the, um, I had, this is the complete, complete um, literary interlinear Bible. All right? So I use this a lot of times. To, pro, to proclaim the year of favor of Yahweh, no punctuation marks. And the day, and this is, so this is the, the Hebrew right here. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn. What is the possible meaning of this? Let's look at this. This is verse, that was two, three. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I'm, a, I'm showing you this from forward, backwards, in the middle. To I want, I want you all to see what I'm showing you here. This is 61, verse 2, 3, and 4. To proclaim the favorable, favorable year of the Lord. That's where Jesus stopped reading, right there. And the day of vengeance of our God, semicolon. To comfort all who mourn. To grant those who mourn in Zion. Giving them a garland instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness. Some translations say terebinth tree. So a terebinth tree is an oak tree. The planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then they will build the, rebuild the ancient ruins. Does that mean anything to anybody? Then, after what happened... In verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Jesus stops reading at verse 2a in the middle of a sentence. The sentence continues on. Then they will rebuild their ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. And they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. What Jesus is showing us that his mission come in more than one phase. 
the first phase of his mission stopped right there in the middle of that sentence. The second phase of his mission begins in the latter, in the, right there in the white, and just as much as God has, has sent his son Jesus to save the world, Jesus' mission is not finished. And the day of vengeance of our God. Now, to comfort all who mourn, we don't have anything to fear. We who are in, who are in Zion, who are in Christ, we're the bride. Everything's kosher. But somebody better be looking out. Because his mission is, is, is going to be completed. The prophet Isaiah could not see the roughly 2,000 years time differentiation between the fulfillment of this prophecy. You see that, Pastor? Pastor? When Isaiah was given the prophecy, he was given the whole thing and he wrote it down. But he couldn't see that the prophecy was broken apart by thousands of years. Wow, that, that's like an amazing little nugget. Verse 5. Now listen to the description. And don't let me forget to give you some homework. Well. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks. Now see, remember, all that what I'm reading is after this then, and that's after the day of vengeance is completed. That's just straight the way the context of this passage reads. I mean, and once you see it like this, you're not going to unsee it. It is what it is. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. Because, see, remember not too long ago, I told you. Well, let me, let me start out by asking you a question Is Jesus going back to the Old Testament system of sacrifice and the law? No. No matter, no, no matter how many bulls and goats and sheep you want to sacrifice and turtle doves and chickens and anything else, you want to throw an elephant in there, whatever, God's not accepting those sacrifices anymore. Jesus completed that type and shadow, right? So Jesus, the temple, and Jesus said, you tear this temple down, in three days I'm going to raise it up again. And, he, and the Bible tells us he wasn't talking about the physical temple that the disciples were showing them, him. They were talking about, he was talking about his body, right? But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame... You will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. Don't let anybody try to fool you or pull the wool over your eyes that that, that scripture has come to pass right now because there is a nation of Israel. They, don't, they have a very hard life. The, the Palestinians, they're, they're just like what we're seeing. We're not in Portland. We're not in, in you know, uh, the state of Washington. We're not in Seattle. But there's coming a time when this nation is going to be filled with terrorists. The Bible Belt is probably going to be one of the last areas that it comes to pass. But it's coming. It's coming. 
they, they do not have everlasting joy right now. Listen to this. Let's just read it a little more. For I, the Lord, love justice. What have I shown you at least eight to ten times? What is the gayest city in the world? Tel Aviv. We didn't give it that title. We're just reading, you know, what, what everybody's telling us and what Google's saying, you know, Wikipedia, whatever, you know, look it up. And for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and the burnt offering. And I will faithfully give them their recompense and making, make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the people. All who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. Remember, now I'm not teaching you this tonight, but I, I just like to put a bug in your ear. I, we've talked about it a number of times in the seven letters, two of the letters. Somebody is presenting themselves to be Jews, but they're not. They're imposters, okay? They are of the synagogue of Satan. So you you got to understand, and I taught you about the parable of the fig tree, and then the parable, I mean, the, and then the olive tree. True Israel, that's the olive tree. The fig tree is, is an imposter. And Jesus said he cursed them on his way back out, you know, his uh, final week. And he said, don't ever let there be fruit on them again. Verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. Listen to this. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Did you know that we're children of Abraham by faith? Literally, we are. This is what we by faith are children of Abraham. We are, we are fully adopted and qualified and we have been clothed because we've put on the Lord Jesus Christ the garments of salvation. There is no other garment of salvation. The garment of the high priest, of the Le Levitical high priest, of Aaron's line, he's not the high priest, not for us. We have a high priest up in heaven far above any man you know, any man here on earth putting on a robe and trying to offer any sacrifice. There's been an ultimate sacrifice. That's Jesus Christ and his blood. Right? For he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is marriage language right here. Right? Who's, who does this sound like? This sounds like the bride of Christ, which is a Gentile bride, but he, during part of this vengeance process that's going to be fulfilled, he is, the, you know, some of the original olive branch is going to be regrafted back in. And we're going to be combined into one bride, right? Those two become one. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile nor male nor female, right? We're one. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Could, can, can you... Stand, you know, on a firm foundation and say, the Israel we see today with Tel Aviv as the gayest city in the world, can you qualify that, that that's righteousness and praise and that's, that's the example that's being set before all nations? I mean, I'm sorry, but no is the answer. And listen, I love all people. And every person, no matter what you're seeing, you need to turn to the Lord and, and receive salvation. And God can save anybody. 
that will come to him by faith through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But we're going to back up. That was 61. Your homework, I want you to go home and with what I've told you tonight and shown you, you can read Luke chapter 4, but read Isaiah 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, and get a feel for how prophetic this is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 59. This is not nice. It's not fun. All right? Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his Ear so dull that it cannot hear. God's not deaf. The Lord's not deaf. He hears the cries of his people. But something's wrong. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. See, the Lord plainly tells us right there, hey, I can save you. Listen to this. People that want to drape the cross in the American flag. America, the Lord can save you, but it might not be through the saving of this nation. If Israel was, and, and Jerusalem was the apple of God's eye, and she you know, through the period, or, and now is a harlot, God cast her away. Now, he's going to bring her back, all right? He's going to, but it's not the Jerusalem that we picture now. New Jerusalem's coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, all right? God can save. You know, you, you, if you're living in sin... He can hear, but he's not, he's not acknowledging it. He's turned the deaf ear. He's not deaf. Your iniquities have separated you between you and God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Listen to this. For your hands are defiled with blood. The Lord put it on my heart, and I tried and tried and tried to tell you, and it's even now. Abortion is an evil and abomination from hell. You, you don't shed. I was trying to look up some numbers today. And they have a clock that's counting. And it's, it's when you click on it on your phone. And it's going on 5 million. This year. 5 million this year. COVID ain't took out nowhere near that many in the United, you know. 80 million. I mean, no, nobody, only God knows the number. But this is one of the things that separated God from seeing, hearing, helping. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood. You think, you think God's going to come rescue this nation with all the lies? I mean, somewhere, you know, this, this chapter gets down to the nitty gritty right here. But, and and I'm gonna re, we're going to read it, but you gotta, you got to read this more than one time, you know. And you got to put it in context. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutter, mutters wickedness. No one sues righteously and no one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies. They conceive mis mischief and bring forth iniquity. So back to draping the, the American flag over the cross or with the cross. And then 1962, can't pray in schools. We, we looked at this. We've looked at this a number of times, right? Then you look at the morality Justice, everything has fallen off the charts 
When, in 1982, they took the Ten Commandments out of school, right? You cannot teach creation. You cannot teach that God created us. But we can teach witchcraft. You can teach everything else under the sun. You can teach that we were a tadpole and we were monkeys and, and that, and you know, whatever else and whatever they want to put in that line. And they teach our, our young people that you can have sex just because you're an animal. With whom and what, whatever. Now, if you're, the rules, and they've been this way for 30 or 40 years. A 12-year-old girl can go have an abortion and don't have to tell their parents. I feel some righteous indignation rising up in me. They can't, they can't give them an aspirin without their parents' permission, but they can take them and have an abortion during the day, and it's possible the parents would, might not ever know. Your lips, your hands are defiled with blood. We think we're all so high and mighty, and we're no better. We're worse because they did everything they did, and we do it and mock God and want God out of the equation and watch our sins on television through Hollywood. Hellavision, that's what some preachers called it 30, 40 years ago, you know. No one sues righteously. No one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion. This is confusion uh, by a multiple of a thousand. And speak lies. <laughs> Unity this, I mean... Come on. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. This Many sermons have come from this, next, this verse, several verses. No one calls for justice. But see, millions and millions and millions and millions of people, we had a chance to get rid of the scourge of abortion. It's in God's hands, friends. For selfish reasons, you want to turn your back against God. And you want, that, you want innocent blood to be on your hands. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for the truth. People that are praying and are pleading with God and trying to intercede for this nation don't stop. But I told you a Holy Ghost message that not long ago, it's like two months ago, or less than two months ago, that God was going to soon take his hand off of this nation, and this nation will be no more. So all these little petty things that you see going on, it ain't going to matter real, a whole lot. Listen to this. They trust in empty words and speak lies. Empty words. Empty promises. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Hey, friends, all I'm doing is reading the Bible to you. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. Man, I've heard some good sermons out of that verse right there. He who eats of their eggs dies. I'm going to tell you right now, this, and, and I'm pulling this out because more than one time this talks about shedding innocent blood and, and, and shedding blood. And this, there is no more innocent shedding of blood than, than uh, abortion. The number one killer in the world my granddaughters was at my house last night. And one is a little bitty baby. And I'm, I'm just oohing and aahing over this little baby and how beautiful and, and perfect in, in every way this little baby is. And human beings that, that can suck that out of the womb 
and destroy that and, and cut that baby's life off. God help you. And anybody that supports the practice. God help you. Because your hands, you're a 100% accomplice to the fact. They hatch viper. Listen, and if you listen and you follow the dogma and you drink the Kool-Aid, they're hatching viper's eggs and they weave the spider's webs. He who eats of their spider, those, their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, you try to stamp it out, you crush it and more vipers come out. Listen, there's, it, it came for, for Israel. We want to drape the, the flag and, you know, God bless America. It hurt my feelings Saturday. They were, they were inducting NFL players into the Hall of Fame, you know. And, and, and those men have put decades of their life and so much energy into that game, right? And, and the, the pinnacle of, of what they can do, one, you can win Super Bowls, but even beyond that, they can become a, a bronze bust of, of their face will be put into the NFL Hall of Fame. And so they're, they're giving out awards, and, they're, and, and the... This legacy is going to go on forever. You're going to be, oh, I was looking so forward to this. A couple people said, I, I thank God, and they thank their coaches, and they thank their family, and they thanked everybody else. Not one could mention the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, they think they're going to be enshrined forever, but I want my name enshrined somewhere else up in heaven that, that's going to really be forever. That's not going to come crashing down. That's not going to be burned out. Listen, they, you can say whatever you want to say. Their sin is, gonna, is not going to be covered. Their truth and, and the foundation that they've laid, their webs will not become garments. Nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. And the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. And they make haste to shed innocent blood. That line right there. If, if I was going to put anything on Wikipedia... That's, that, that would be under abortion. Shedding innocent blood right there. See, in the Bible, they offered their children to Molech, right? It was nothing for Herod and, and Pharaoh and, and all these other, you know, to, to wipe out the children. And God put us here. See, reason why we're the planting of the Lord. God planted us here so we could bear fruit. But that's not, we're, it's not a literal fruit. It's bearing children. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Therefore, okay, all of that. You see, I started this out showing you that Jesus stopped in the middle of a sentence. In phase one, when he arrived on the scene and he went into his public ministry, phase one, how long was his ministry? Three and a half years. Add three and a half more years to that. When it, the great tribulation period is three and a half. That's the second phase and second half of, of his seven-year ministry. That's that specific. I've taught you before the principle of a week and 6,006 days. A day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. And the seventh day is a thousand-year millennial reign. That's the seventh day. Jesus' ministry was in two phases. Phase two 
is going to be the vengeance phase. And it's going to line up just like he came the first time and they missed it. All right? And this, is, this set the stage for him coming the first time. In the midst of all this, he came the first time. And this is what we're living in right now. You think this thing is not going to go on for years and years and years. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. Because spiritually they're blind as a bat and they don't have sonar. Hmm? We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. See, you. there's a lot of people that I love and they can see the same current events that I can see. They can see the same thing that I can see coming down. And it's plain as day for me. I, I would be fe fearful for my life not to be in Christ and be saved. It's a fearful. That's, that's exactly what I want everybody to see. This is more even now. It's more real now. And we're at the end. This is now it's the second phase of, the, of Christ's ministry. He stopped in the middle of a sentence. He's, he's going to pick it up. Just like it came true. And he said, he's going to say, bam, the rapture, the trumpet's going to sound. The bride is going to be out of here. But then, now, this Scripture, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Boom. Second phase. We all growl like, growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions, see, what you do is yelling louder, right? It's bearing witness. What we do as a nation, the people we put in charge and tolerate. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, don't you, don't, don't you support abortion and support the murder of, and shedding of innocent blood and, and name the name of Christ in the same breath. Don't do it. I believe you'd be better off to say, I'm guilty. Now wait a minute. I'm going to phrase it with this. There's a lot of people, a lot of innocent girls and women that you were raised up on the dogma that I'm talking about. God and the grace of God extends with open arms a, a way back home and forgiveness. But that's not always going to be there. In transgressing a line against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. This, that verse... Right. And well, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. We, we're all fallen, you know, from God. 
And we all have to have salvation. So once you, if a light bulb goes off and the Spirit's drawing you, run to the altar, run to Christ, receive salvation, and repent. You know, God is still, he'll cast our past into the sea of forgetfulness. There is grace and the door is open. But the, the time, the, the last grains of sand out of God's hourglass are, are, are quickly falling through. Time is running out. Conceiving another from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity, which is honesty and uprightness, cannot enter. I keep seeing it's from the government, it's from the people, okay? Thank God this, thank God for that. God, you know I love you, but you said the name above all names is your son's name, which is Jesus or Yeshua, whichever one you want to call him. You better start naming. If, if whatever you're involved with, is, is you're ashamed to name the name of Jesus? See, God, somebody might mistake God for Allah God or Buddha God or any other God or supposed God. But Jesus, everybody knows who we're talking about. Huh? At that name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And I'm and justice for the accomplices. Just like what you were saying. No justice for the accomplices. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. This is talking about Jesus coming. For his first phase. And his own righteousness it sustained him. But see actually he's talking about the whole sentence. And, and the verses 1, 2, and 3 in Isaiah 61. And you know because all this is tied together. Look, look how much New Testament is pulled from this, this portion right here. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Does that sound like the full armor of God in Ephesians? Huh? And a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. Don't you tell me God, God is love, God is love, God is love. Yes, God is love. But God loves this whole world. He, he loves this world, not the sin of this world. For us to exist in his presence... God's judgment and God's vengeance is going to be exacted on this planet. Just choose to go, go toward the light. Go towards Jesus Christ. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Brother Darcy, he put on righteousness as a breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head, he put the garments that are dyed red from Basra from treading out the wine princes of God and he was happy to do it. He put the cloak on over that of zeal. Psh. I'm just reading you the Bible. This is not my personal opinion. I'm just trying to write and divide the Bible. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, see, some people looked this up a long time ago and they corrected this. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That comma is not in there right there like that. I, I'm going to show you. This is the same verse. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. The devil's not coming in like a flood. 
Jesus is coming in like a flood. I showed it to you in this complete biblical library, interlinear Bible. And they will fear from the west the name of Yahweh and from the rising of the sun, his glory because he will come like a stream, narrow, the spirit of Yahweh, it drives him. What happens when you take a, a water hose and you got a, a, you know, a pressure washer or something on the end of it and you compress that water pressure and you make it and you make it like a stream, right? A narrow stream. What happens? It'll cut the earth. It'll cut the Grand Canyon. It'll cut the earth like, like some kind of power you ain't never seen. When the enemy comes in, the, the wind of the Holy Spirit will com, compact the water of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will blast through anything the, the devil tries to put in your way. Isaiah 59, 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my, my covenant with them. This is talking to the church again right here. My spirit who is upon you and my words with which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Joshua said, it's for, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In the New Testament, it says, how long will you halt between two opinions in the King James? How long will you ride the fence? How long will you stand on, you know, the, I heard a preacher just over this past week say, the devil owns the fence. Hello? The devil owns the fence. Get off of the fence. Last Monday night, and over, there's been several hundred people watch it, you know. Bless God, you know. That's a testimony. Uh, this little group right here, and hundreds of people. And share it. Share, share the word, you know, if this is a blessing and, and ministers to you. But the um, run to the altar or run for your life. This is what's coming. This is what it's down to. You know, I'm, I'm not sugarcoating it and I'm not dressing it up. I'm just telling you like it is. That is one tough chapter if you're on the dark side of that. I, I, want, I want an insurance policy. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is my insurance policy. Huh? I want a retirement plan. The blood of Jesus is my retirement plan. Huh? Everybody's trusting in all this stuff and they're so worried about all this and trying to get their life lined out like a rich man. Oh, I got plenty of stuff. I got plenty of retirement. I got plenty of 401k. I'm going to build barns. I'm going to do this. I'm going to play golf. All this, whatever, whatever I want to do. And you got time for everything for you. But you don't have no time for God or very little time for God. Well, I feel it. It's a nice thought. God bless America, one nation under God. But whose God is this nation serving? And, and I'm not talking about the people. There are millions and millions and millions of people that are on their knees, on their face before God, crying out for God and hungry for God. And I told you before, we're the only thing, hold the glue, the church, the spirit-filled church is the only thing holding this thing together from exploding, from blowing up. When that's gone, when, see, the passage in the Old Testament, two days will pass, and I'm paraphrasing, three days and I will raise you up in my sight. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. How many days wages did he give the innkeeper? Two days. 
50. Jesus was crucified in 2030. I mean, uh, 30 AD. We're almost at 2030. If, if we allow for a seven-year tribulation period, we just have a few years. I'm not trying to set no date. But I know what the Lord is speaking to us here. I know what I see and feel in my spirit. And I can see the current events and how they line up. And, and Brother Dawson, just like you said, that is more real now in the time that we live than ever before. We need to pray. Pray for your family. Witness to your family. The hardest people to witness to and win is your family. For some, Just like Jesus, a prophet. He's not a prophet in his hometown. You know, nobody, no, nobody, he could only heal where he come from. He could only heal a few sick folk that had mustered, you know, a little bit of faith. But, all right, I'm going to stop right here. Don't forget your homework because I hit you with some heavy stuff. Um, that's Luke 4, but it goes back, and that was Isaiah 61 and 59. But read, read several chapters right through there and, and, you know, meditate on it and pray about it and ask God to open your eyes about it. But God bless you and we love you and, and uh, share it with as many times as, as you can. God bless you.